Welcome to ARVN, Amateur Radio Video News. The program you're about to see is free to watch, courtesy of YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. But it wasn't free to make. ARVN's got a lot of money invested in video equipment like this sweet camera and that editing system back there. And it takes a lot of time to shoot and edit a program like this. So I'm asking you to make a voluntary payment, contribution, whatever you want to call it. Just stop by our website, arvn.tv, and you'll see a link to make that payment, whatever you think the program is worth to you. I guess you could say that this program is brought to you by you. So thanks for watching and enjoy the show. It's our distinct pleasure. Oh, no. <laughs> Tell another lie. <laughs> Uh, no DCC would be without him <laughs> in the left corner. All right, Mr. Bob McGuire in 4HY is going to tell us what Flex Radio has been up to. First, I'm going to tell you what this is and this. How many of you think you know what this is? It's Director of Special Projects. <laughs> and this is chief advisory officer <laughs> are these two made up titles or what okay anyway so uh i've left uh ida in princeton and i'm uh, at uh, virginia tech now where i'm director of research of the hume center the hume center was started by ted and his wife karen uh, they have had a long and illustrious career in and around the intelligence community but the united states is faced with a serious serious problem we need highly qualified people with technical degrees to go and work in the intelligence community or for its contractors or around the intelligence community because it's hard to outsource project management of classified projects to India or China. So or it just won't quite work. So uh, what we find is that uh, 90 plus percent of our uh, undergraduate engineering and science students at Virginia Tech are United States citizens. But we go from year four to year five, and that completely inverts itself. So Hume has put his money where his mouth is, and our job is to uh, attract United States citizen talent and keep them going to graduate school and into the community working for DOD or the intelligence community or whatever. And that's the mission. So anyway, it's, it's an interesting new job for me, and I'm happy to be able to be here and tell you a little bit about what I've been doing, but also I've been doing stuff with Flex, and you'll see some of, uh, a, a little bit of my work in here and a lot of work that's been going on in Austin in the last year. So there's some company news, some new hardware, Power SDR2 keeps growing, and we've got some upcoming enhancements. The, uh, this is out of date. Most of what I'll be telling you about is already in. Okay, so this is the new building. Uh, major increase in space. They double the office space on the 1st of June. A massive thing at Dayton. How many of you saw the booth at Dayton? Looked like a real radio company for the first time. <laughs> uh, the, the, what, let me, you know what streamlined logistics center means? They outsourced all logistics. <laughs> They've got a lot of new uh, key employees. Uh, uh, this is Steve Hicks's wife, and what a she was the designer in completely of the Dayton ham uh, Dayton booth for Flex. So that tells you why she is very valuable to the company. She is a professional and did a great job. Uh, uh, Neil has since moved on, but two more people have come in to do FPGA programming, and Graham Haddock. How many of you know who Graham is? He was the uh, he's involved in the HPSDR effort, uh, but he's joined Flex. Graham was Motorola's uh, uh, senior vice president. He was in charge of all the land, mobile, and uh, cell site effort for Motorola until they decided they weren't going to do much manufacturing anymore. Okay, so Graham's, uh, Graham's the designer of the Flex 1500, and he is working on commercial efforts now. Okay, so you can really hear flex radio stuff on the air. And it's funny to me to get on uh, 20 or 40 meters and so forth and be listening to a QSO and somebody will be commenting on um, 
uh, the, the other fellow signal and they'll say, you know, I see so forth and so on. Not I hear, but I see. And I, uh, I'm really proud of that. That little piece right in the middle there, I had to fight for that. And, but, it, but, but it's all right. We, after we got over the what, what do we really want to do with it, uh, it was a lot of fun to get it going, but this pan adapter, it's kind of changed radio in a big way. I mean, how many of us are old enough to remember the pan adapters we bought from Heathkit, but I mean, this is a little more versatile. So, uh, uh, real men don't need, but half a lot of people want them, so Flex Radio's got a knob. This is the Flex 1500, and uh, Power SDR2 is released, and... Uh, and there's a plan now for quarterly Power SDR updates. Steve Hicks, being the vice president for engineering and development, has been a big, a, has a, had a big impact. Okay, so uh, it was introduced uh, Dayton in last year, and uh, the number of sales of this radio was completely underestimated, at uh, uh, between it's like seven hundred and sixty dollars or somewhere around there. Um, it's really been a phenomenal seller. And they literally did have trouble keeping up with the demand. Uh, so, uh, but it's, it's, it's well underway. Uh, the 1500 ships a lot. Uh, here, this is the knob. It uh, has soft buttons. Uh, you can program them as you will, as you might expect in a software controlled and or software defined radio. All, all, these, all these controls are uh, remappable to different functions. Uh, I like it myself. This is the first one of these knobs I've liked. I had the, how many of you have a flex radio? And how many of you had the Griffin knob? Right, about half of those were, yeah, and I used mine, watched the, watched the glowing UFO go in and out for a little while and unplugged it and put it in the corner and haven't used it since. But this one I find useful, uh, primarily because the work has now been done to help you use this knob and not lose focus on your logging program by the use of this knob. And of course, everyone who's ever run a contest knows that you do not want to be shoving a mouse over to your radio control and then back to your logging program because you just lost three QSOs in all of that movement. So it complete, the way the Flex Radio and the Power SDR worked before the knob, you completely interrupted the contester's workflow. With the knob, the contester's workflow is no longer invented. That's, uh, that's unless you want to do something uh, a little weird, in which case this probably doesn't support it, but this has gone a long way. And uh, some development has gone on software. Uh, DDUtil is uh, by Steve Nance is a big deal and helps write all these drivers to different hardware devices like um, uh, antenna rotators, uh, computer controlled antenna tuners and amplifiers and so forth, DDUtil interfaces between power SDR and those devices. And this uh, knob is compatible with all the flex radios. Okay, uh, flex radio had somebody uh, ask them to develop a high dynamic range receiver. Uh, and the, the, the customers might be all near the front of the room, uh, but anyway, so, uh, or giving the talk. Uh, so uh, this is, what is this? This is a remarkable piece of engineering. So it's based on the QSD, which was first released in the Software Defined Radio 1000, and then uh, uh, an analysis of what, what was going on in the QSD in the 1000 was done, and new improvements were made for the QSD circuit uh, for the Flex 5000, but uh, we knew we had left performance on the table. So uh, the performance that was left on the table was put back into this commercial offering. So this is 32 receivers in a 6U by rack wide box. So that's a rack mountable box. So it's 32 receivers. They are phase coherent. There is an FPGA driven communications board right here and control and data leave through gigabit ethernet. So uh, it's 115 dB, uh, honest to goodness IMD dynamic range, huge dynamic range for HF. Now in a, in a, in a um, normal super heterodyne receiver, what would, ex uh, what would extremely large dynamic range mean? 
It would mean that the mixers inside were high level and 32 of them times 32 high powered mixers would be lots and lots of power. I'm about to tell you one of the revolutionary things that goes on when you use the QSD and you're, not, you're no longer passing power through uh, uh, crystal filters and mixers and amplifiers and need to amplify it because it's a voltage sensing device and high, uh, inherently fairly high impedance and the thing you're terminating in is an A to D rather than trying to get it amplified and through another mixer. Those 32 receivers, preamps and everything flamed, FPGA poking data out the gigabit ethernet ports as fast as it can go. So we've got everything turned on and flowing. That entire crate burns 100 watts. That is a remarkable piece of engineering. And I am really happy that this got done. Okay. So uh, with the same entity uh, in DOD, there's a, uh, uh, they're working on a wideband L-band receiver uh, for the same DOD entity and that has gone very well and Flex is doing really well in the commercial and uh, DOD world. Uh, Southwest Research bought uh, a Flex 5000 and had the software modified so they could do ionosonds and you're looking at Power SDR doing the ionosond activity. The thing that was neat about the Flex 5000 is uh, the, the, the QSE, which is turn the QSD around and make it a transmitter, has an information hole at DC. And this information, I mean, the, the receiver has an information hole at DC, so the transmitter can sit in the information hole, and it's hugely large number of dB down. So, Southwest Research took a Flex 5000, did a modification to the software, and they're able to take every ionosond they have in the world and divide the amount of power required to run the ionosond by 20 dB. So they took their kilowatt transmitters and turned them into very, very tiny power, single digit to tens of watts at most in their ionosonce. Southwest Research is very happy with Flex. Okay, so the CDRX1000, I've told you, uh, it's uh, with a phase coherent uh, receivers and excellent uh, control. It's useful in HF direction finding, uh, HF geolocation work, and over the horizon radar work. It's being used in these places. Uh, and, and so there's reawakened interest uh, by the intelligence community in HF. Uh, we heard for years that HF was dead, and now the, the uh, intelligence agency, for, uh, the intelligence, intelligence Advanced Research Project Agency, has released a broad area announcement for HF geolocation work. So real money is being spent by the intelligence community again on HF because they know that. It has things to recommend it to the potential adversaries of the U.S. and its allies. So that's what I thought it was interesting. This is the reduced model that SWERI wanted, and they got a reduced model for some other job they're doing for the Navy, I think. And this is the uh, ionosond running in the Power SDR. And here's some sporadic E returns. So let's talk about Power SDR for a minute. Uh, I know Gerald likes to say uh, as often as he can that uh, the flex radio equipment is the radio that keeps getting better, and that's really because the software keeps evolving. Um, so you can, uh, with Power SDR uh, 2 when it came out, you got the, the new user interface and the ability to skin it, and people are releasing skins. So anybody can release a skin for the radio and several people have released skins for it. So it's a completely skinnable package. You can make your own background, make it look like whatever you want. I keep waiting for somebody to turn it into the Collins S line, but that hasn't quite happened yet. <laughs> and for those of you who are too young to remember the Collins S line, forget you. <laughs> okay, so now you can do multi-radio launch. So uh, if you come by the booth later, I'll show you the thing running both the Flex 5000 and the 1500, and it figures out what radios you have installed. It saves a, a, a unique identifier for it, and when you start Power SDR, it says which radio do you wish to use, and uh, sets itself up for it. Okay, so uh, I am responsible for this. This is the wideband image reject algorithm. So. Uh, 
as you may know, direct conversion receivers have suffered a problem. That is the problem being that when you do direct conversion to baseband, the image uh, is not suppressed perfectly because the analog, you still have to have analog pieces in software defined radio. So the analog pieces are the when we go to, from uh, A frequency direct to baseband, you know it becomes a complex signal. There's an I component and a Q component. So if the amplifiers and, and, and pieces of analog equipment, coax, traces on a circuit board, all those things, if they aren't exactly the same electrical length and have exactly the same transfer function, the same gain through them, then the I component and the Q component have different gains or different phase lengths. When you have a different phase length or a different amplitude component, then the image does not become rejected perfectly. So if I had a carrier and I was sitting at a zero frequency looking at the carrier uh, and it was or it's just slightly off frequency, just make it just slightly off frequency, then uh, if I looked at a phase plot, rather than being a circle on the phase plot, if the amplitude is uh, imperfect, then the, then, the, then the phase circle would look like an egg. It would look like an ellipse. So if the phase was perfect, it would look like an ellipse uh, elongated this way or elongated that way, it wouldn't be a circle. And let's suppose that there's a phase delay difference between the two lines. Then the squashed circle would be rotated. So what do we want to do? We want to be able to remove the rotation and the squash the thing back into a perfect unit circle. So that algorithm we've had in since the software defined radio 1000. As soon as we recognized this was going to be an impediment, especially after we put the pan adapter out and people could see a hundred dB of stuff, uh, we had to fix this. Well, it was easily fixed, but the, the, the detector, the mixer, in the, the mixer detector in the, in the flex radio uh, is a beautiful thing, very high dynamic range, but it had frequency dependence on the amplitude and phase delay. So you needed to remove this frequency dependence. I'm not going to go into the math of this, but it took me only 18 months to get it right. Uh, so so, uh, so I'm, uh, I'd hate to go back and have my, uh, my, my thesis professor tell me how long it took uh, me to tell him how long it took me to get it right, but I got it right. So now it's completely automated. You don't need to do anything. Uh, you drop on a frequency, uh, starts listening to the band, and it figures out the image rejection calculation across the entire band. Uh, so now it, the frequency dependence, the phase rotation, and so forth is removed. There is one more piece of work we're going to add to this as I get time. How many of you know who Fred Harris is? Yeah, so Fred Harris is a very famous engineer, and he and I have become very good friends and collaborators. So uh, Fred uh, taught me the practicalities and the theory and so forth behind polyphase filter banks. So I'm not going to go into what that is. But anyway, we could greatly increase the sensitivity and performance of WBIR and lots of other things in the software-defined radio world by implementing some polyphase filter banks, including this would be, this would be remarkably improved. Okay, so I'm not going to go into what that is, but this is in there now and it works. Image rejection is no longer a problem in the, in the direct conversion things. This was, uh, uh, and it will not be, and it will get better with time. Okay, so yeah, the, the, the other thing we did was we greatly improved the ALC algorithms uh, in, uh, by improving the thing that runs the ALC and the AGC. Let me tell you what ALC improve, enhanced ALC algorithms means. What do you think it means? No ALC. There's, there's, no, there's no analog ALC, but there is ALC. But Okay, there's ALC inside the thing, but there's no analog ALC. You don't really need it. Uh, with, with the software radio. But, but what, so we improve the algorithms. What do you think improve the algorithms means? Improve software. No, no, it was already written. But after you write software, what do you have to do? Yes. Debug it. Debug it. <laughs> <laughs> so enhanced ALC algorithms means I fixed an ugly pointer bug and then did some retuning. And then it worked fantastically well. So the thing that we 
uh, have done in the Power SDR a, a, AGC and ALC system is there's no such thing as overshoot. The reason there's no such thing as overshoot is uh, we can do a thing in software radio you can't do an analog radio. So let's suppose that I want to, uh, by the time I get to out, I want to be at the correct amplitude. So I'm going to delay my application of gain to the word out until I get to the word out. But I'm going to start looking over here. And I'm going to look and see what the signal looks like while I'm here. And I'll do a little adjustment. And I'll do a little adjustment. And looking at the signal, looking at the signal. And by the time I'm at the word out, I will have figured out the correct gain to apply. So I'm going to delay the output a little bit, look at the signal for a little while, compute the correct gain, and then apply it. That means I don't have overshoot because I've anticipated the correct gain. And the amount of latency that's introduced here is well under a millisecond. You never notice it. Okay. Uh, so uh, it really works beautifully, especially after we've debugged the pointers. Okay. Ah, this was not just debugging. This was a complete, re total, brand new rewrite uh, directed by Steve Hicks of how CW was done on the radio. What a remarkable improvement. Uh, if the hardware could turn around uh, as fast as we wanted to, the software is completely capable of QSK. But the hardware turning around, going through firewire and all this other stuff just can't happen quite fast enough to do full QSK. But it's very good semi-break-in performance. Uh, it's just a complete transformation. So it was rewritten from the ground up, and it does work beautifully. And that's, this is part and parcel of the same thing. Um, and I'm not going to go into this technical mess. Just let's say that the transmit, receive, turnaround stuff is all improved. All the kind of funky pings and all that stuff that we're, we're requiring delay and so forth, all of that's gone. It's just fixed. It works. Okay, so uh, you can do synchronous recording between uh, the two receivers in the Flex 5000 and um, a like enhanced signal clarity. How do you like the trademark on that? That's, that's cool. So let me tell you what that means. I've got two coherent receivers hooked to two antennas. I can do diversity work and phased arrays. So they wanted a sexy name for phased array or diversity, and so they called it enhanced signal clarity. Okay, so uh, the oh, so one of the new engineers hired by Flex uh, came in, and he was asked to work on the automatic antenna tuning unit in the Flex 3000. It was supposed to have a, a three and a half to one range. So if the if the standing wave ratio was three and a half to one or better. Or, or, or better, you could suppress it to one to one. You could do the matching. So um, Abed came. Abed Hawk, who is the uh, new hire from uh, Texas, came in, and he was given this job. And he did he did some new math. And the new math uh, is a very interesting algorithm to how to tune the the capacitors and coils in the uh, antenna tuning unit. So what anybody else would, would say can't be better than three to one, I have witnessed this thing work and reduce seven to one to one to one. It is a remarkable improvement in, in the control of an antenna ter uh, uh, terminal unit. So it's just all the way around the circle. It doesn't matter whether it's capacitive or inductive, it just works. It is a remarkable piece of work. I mean, it's really, really nice. And it's very fast, and uh, it's a really good piece of work. And it, look, this is what they're willing to claim because they have not gone out and tested every possible load. I'm telling you, it, it tunes greater than 7 to 1. It's just remarkable. And this design was, well, you know, we only need 3 to 1. Let's get it to work. And they got 7 to 1, and it'll do more. Okay. So uh, we, the Flex 1500 is now well supported, and they, it really does have excellent CW performance. Uh, and it's USB 2, uh, making it you know, easier to set up and uh, uses live USB. So uh, if somebody had the time, they could easily write a Linux algorithm, a Linux uh, driver to support it, and it would be good. That just hasn't been done yet. But it could be because it uses live USB.
Uh, and this is a 5-watt radio, and there you go. Ah, it, it, the, the, the thing that everyone will remember is putting together all of the pieces and getting it all glued together and installed for the first few years. Abed Hock, who did the ATU algorithm, came in and did an integrated installer, and it works perfectly. I've not seen the thing fail yet. If there are conflicting components, it removes them and installs over them, installs firmware, drivers, software, everything. It is a completely standard wizard-based installer, and it really does just work. Okay, so Power SDR 2.1, uh, it was released. So this is, this is a little old. Uh, so we have FM support now because the VU module has been out for a while and FM is now supported well for repeaters. Uh, Pre-emphasis and de-emphasis is now added to the stuff that I did without bothering to do pre-emphasis or de-emphasis. And uh, the, the, the tones are available for uh, repeater control for, uh, and uh, there are new forms for uh, working the FM modes and there's uh, all brand new memory management plans so you can store all your rep favorite repeaters and offsets and so lots of bug fixes and other things were done and it is released. And here's the new FM control panel, you get the idea, and these things are saved in, in, in uh, memories in, for quick recall. And here's the memory management form. It looks like others you've seen uh, where you've got computer desktop control of your whatever, your FT817 and you load a bunch of memories in and it saves it. That's done automatically now in PowerSDR. Uh, so, yes. So we have out have out in beta form, not out alpha form, the tracking notch filters and the enhanced clarity functionality. This means the diversity control with a little radar allowing you to tune the antenna pattern so you drop a null on an interferer or gain on the station of interest depending on what improves the signal to noise and interference ratio to the maximum degree to your ear. And you can tune both the amplitude and phase of the two antennas and really put a deep notch on a bad guy or enhance quite a bit of the signal of interest. Now, uh, one of the things that we've, has been uh, complained about the most is, is we had, uh, did not have manual notch filters. So we were not satisfied with doing just a manual notch. So there now are cascadable manual notches. You can cascade three of them if you, if you need to get a lot of rejection. But let's suppose that you make a notch on top of a bad interferer. And you say, okay, well, one deep is not good enough. Let me do two or let me do three. All right, so now you've got a very, very narrow notch with your Cascade 3 uh, of these regular manual notches. So we're talking about a radio that you can just point and click and drag the screen. So it would be really, really bad to have a one hertz wide notch that you've moved off of with just a bump of the mouse. So now the thing completely tracks. So you drop a notch on, you design it, you, you notch the bad guy, or, and then you, as you move the radio around, it remembers where it was and it moves the notch. So uh, it's really slick, and I'll be happy to demo it for you later. This is the uh, diversity or, uh, or um, uh, phased array uh, tuning, so you can do not noise notching, as I said, or beam forming. Uh, you can do the quick angle jumps to the obvious places, so you could do in-fire broadside instantly with a push button. Uh, if you had, if you had uh, two antennas up, you could do in-fire or broadside instantly with a button push. Uh, uh, so um, that works well. The tracking notch filters, I said, ooh, it does work beautifully. And so there's a little button here, you turn it, so you, you hit the plus button right there and it adds a notch filter. And you can move the center of the notch filter and then you right click on the vertical bar showing you where the notch filter is and you say I want cascade one, two, or three. You can change the, the Q of the notch filter to have a, whatever width you want and cascade as many of them as you want. It's really remarkable. So I did the, I did the implementation of the notch filter, but all this control and stuff that really makes it work beautifully, that's Steve. Eric and Abit, they did a beautiful job. I mean, the, my part was 20 lines of code, and their part was make it the most beautiful thing I've seen on a radio in a long time. Okay, so anyway, got a few birdies, add a notch, turn the, add a notch, and then turn it on, 
and you can drop it on top. Gives you information about the notch. You see how wide it is, that's setting the cue. Then you can say how, how, or you can move it wider, lower the cue. And you can add more than one, so you can add three, you can add nine uh, now. So you, I don't, and I don't, really, I don't even understand why it's limited to nine, but that's what it's limited to now. And as you tune, it follows the bad guys out of your pass band or back in. And you can have cascade one, two, or three. Uh, I haven't seen anything where three did not put it into the noise floor. Now, these are real notch filters, but they work on the IQ signal. Now, let me tell you why they work on the IQ signal. Because after I've done the passband filtering for IQ, it doesn't matter I'm using a real filter. Only the part of the signal that's on the sideband I care about is impacted by this. So as long as you cascade this after the passband filter, it works perfectly as an IQ notch filter and cost much less to implement than a fully complex notch filter. So it works great. And uh, by, by the way, this, this operates before the AGC. So when I notch a bad guy out, my meter and AGC are no longer captured by the bad guy. So it's remarkable to see a signal way up here in your passband, notch to the noise floor, and then the little weak guy right there come right up out of the noise because you've notched him into the noise floor. And this is yet another testimonial for how good the AGC is. How many of you have gone to Leif Osbrink's uh, Linrad page and looked at his evaluation of AGCs? Have any of you done this? Yeah, if you'll notice, the, one of the few AGCs which survives his scathing scrutiny uh, was the Flex Power SDR AGC, and that is because uh, he dropped a monster signal in next to, right next to a weak guy, and the, the weak signal could be heard, whereas the AGC and every other commercial radio he tested, you could no longer hear the weak guy next to a strong guy. The AGC system in them had moved it above the noise floor and, and put, put the, put the uh, uh, weak signal back into the noise. So anyway. Okay, so there, were there any questions about what was going on? Yes? What was the name of that uh, site for the evaluation of the AGC? Uh, okay, so if you'll Google Linrad, Leif, L-E-I-F, AGC, one of the top answers will be his evaluation of AGCs. L-I-N-R-E. L-I-N-R-A-D. Linrad. Uh, Leif is an interesting person. SM0 BSZ, Leif Osbrink. And he is a physicist from Sweden. And he has been the instructor to many of us on how good algorithms could be done in uh, software defined radio. He is on our software defined radio committee. He was one of the earliest members. Uh, uh, recruited early by Doug when Doug was the uh, SDR chairman and Leif is a very very smart man. Uh, I would not I would not write the code the way he writes it but always you want to watch what Leif does and uh, steal the good ideas because he's he, you know he's he's open source like the rest of us who do this and don't do it for a living uh, and the ideas are there there are completely public domain. So they're very, it's a very good resource. He encourages you. Yeah, he encourages you to take, because what he wants is people's radios to perform better on both transmit and receive. And it's open source and it's pu public domain. There are no copyrights or licenses on his software other than the implied copyright, which he expressly gives away. The link is spelled L-E-I-F. L-E-I-F. L-E-I-F, Leif. And Osprink has a, Diacritical mark over the A, so don't bother with that. But it's SM0 or 5 BSZ. Five. SM5 BSZ. Probably zero. Zulu. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, how much computer horsepower do you need? I, I have a, a, a Flex 1500, and I was recently shopping for a laptop. I want to be able to go portable with it, and I couldn't find any recent statements on how much... Uh, you know, what kind of uh, CPU speed and cache and memory and all that. So, so I, I'll be happy for you to look at my lab. I have an old dual core AMD, 2 gigahertz, no cache whatsoever, 
uh, running Windows Vista 32-bit. Uh, and, you know, in other words, it's a complete piece of junk. And uh, it runs the 1500 and the 3000 simultaneously with no problem. Uh, the basic problem with even the netbooks, which will run the software, is the fact that the screen is in the Right, exactly. So the tiny netbooks, there's not enough uh, resolution on the screen for you to see the details on the pan adapter. And even some of the fine lettering on the display is uh, a, little, a little tough. So uh, I would say that, uh, th that the thing to worry about most with these small devices like netbooks is what is the screen resolution available to you. And they saved power and price by having 800 by 600 or, or 1,000 uh, a, a wide displays, and they're just not quite enough. But horsepower is not a problem. Yeah, yeah. The, the typical 10-inch netbook, it's only 600 pixels high, and, yeah. and you need like a little over. 800 by 600 is just not enough. Dealing with the uh, um, phased array characteristics, obviously since you're transmitting through one side and not the other, then the paths through those two receive antennas are not identical. Yep. Uh, do you have any problems with dissimilarities between the antennas? No, no because that's, that's taken care of in the algorithm. In other words, you can have different gains, different phase lengths, and the software takes care of that as you tune the little radar scope. It's intuitive, but as you move it in and out, the gains are, uh, and wh where you are and the, the, where the dot is in and out takes care of the gain and phase imbalances between the two antennas. So I've used very different antennas and done a pretty good job. Now look, it's not as good as two identical elements where you can tune either in fire or broadside. Uh, it's not as good as that, but it works. It works. I've, I've taken a vertical monopole and a dipole and suppressed a large AM broadcaster that was interfering with my AM DXing, and it worked. Yeah. The, uh, however, the antennas do need to have similar polarization. They do need to have similar, pol similar polarizations. They do need that. A vertical versus a horizontal. Position. But there's a, there is a there is a pro problem. It's, it still works to some degree, but nowhere near as well. Unless you're looking for circularly polarized. Then then you can then you can make your signal circularly polarized with this thing. Well, part of the reason for call it enhanced signal clarity is so that we don't have to have in documentation the the complete and total answer to your question, which is how do we do all of those things when 95% of the people will use it don't care how we did it. They just want it to work. But all of those kind of things are compensated for. I mean, so far, uh, Flex Radio is really concentrated on the HF side and really tethering things to a PC. And I understand the, the uh, desire to keep taking advantage of the improvements in computers as we go along. But is there any interest on Flex Radio in actually trying to go to the uh, embedded side, you know, and actually offer uh, like a modular solution that people can uh, um, kind of uh, Flex radios, so. like any other radio company, they're always trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Mm -hmm. No decisions have been made about what they're going to do next. Mm -hmm. But all sorts of design considerations are being taken into account for what they might do next. I'm just telling you that no decisions have been made. Uh, let me ask you a question about. I'm here. <laughs> let me ask you a question about the user interface. Uh, I know that they've made capabilities for skins now, but I'm wondering if that goes to the point of being able to rearrange buttons or is it simply yeah. change? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And is, so is the underlying API of the, of the radio exposed so that you can pick up those functions and define them in new controls? Well, okay. So uh, a lot of people have heard of like deep impact and wonder what it may be and so forth and so on. So the, the answer to your question is because Power SDR grew in this organic mess. The answer to your question is no. But what will replace it, primarily deep impact is, expose all the layers of the API and separate radio functions from GUI functions to hardware control functions into separate layers so that you can do that kind of stuff. That's really what deep impact is. And it's just not done yet. It will be done, but it's not done yet. It's being worked on all the time. But as you know, a small company, they've got a lot of demands. and uh, m my friends and I, being uh, cu customers of them, uh, c 
kept a small number of people very busy in the last two years developing these commercial offerings. So something had to suffer, and Deep Impact was the thing that suffered, the, all this commercial work they were doing, because they just didn't have the people to do both. Bob, what's going to be the uh, next uh, phases of adding uh, programs to it? What are you going to do next to uh, the, the actual uh, uh, 5,000 or know, I, whatever? I, I, I don't know exactly what's on the list for next, but i tell you what, in, I, when I'm in the booth, we'll look. Uh, but I don't know exactly what it's intended for. Uh, okay, I do know. Uh, I'm sorry, I do know something. Okay, so we're working on the fi we, we, well, a contract was let with a college in Texas for one of the graduate students who's working there to take some of the standard um, voice detection algorithms that were used in radios for a long time and improve them to the point where they would be useful in SDR. So we have a really, really good voice squelch. So that is being actively worked on, and my task is to put that in Power SDR and in the software so we have a very, very, very high quality voice squelch. It, I don't really, because it has slight latency issues, I don't quite, I don't think it'll be very good for Vox, but for squelch of an ugly looking band on HF where you're primarily listening to sideband voice, it works really well. And that's good, that is about to be exposed in the Power SDR stuff. Uh, let's see, uh, what else? That's the thing I'm working on right now. I'm sure that they're working on other stuff that I don't know about. Uh, but I don't know all the things that are in the list. But we can look. Are, is there any work going on on cognitive modes for the digital? So, uh, for, for uh, amateurs? Uh, so most of my cognitive radio work is being done on uh, GNU radio. Uh, hardware and software because uh, there, uh, as, Greg's, as Greg's question aimed at the right heart of it, the entire API is completely exposed and uh, Windows is not popular in uh, graduate student labs for doing uh, software experimentation. So uh, cognitive radio networking, which is what white space really will be all about when it becomes uh, usable by the masses. Uh, is the only cognitive radio network, networking test bed in the whole world right now is at Virginia Tech. So we have an on the air cognitive radio network and we want to be able to um, use different frequencies, do dynamic spectrum access work and all that other kinds of things. So uh, that we have a deployed cognitive radio networking uh, that uses large frequencies and then has backhaul and in-haul done using the internet. There's, there's one device, one collection of devices that does that easily. That's the USERP uh, twos, which are no longer in existence because parts went EOL, but now we have the USERP N210 and the USERP E100. The E100 is an OMAP3530 gum stick embedded processor that sits inside of what looks like a USERP 2, but what you get for that is you get the plug-in cards into the USERP box. So we're doing all that work with USERPs. Uh, the, there, there's all, there'll always be interest in uh, cognitive radio work for, uh, on, on HF in particular, uh, uh, because it would be nice to be able to a lot, a lot of you have seen uh, Joe Taylor's software and other people's software where they automatically scan the band and look for a signal of interest and then fi figure out how to decode the signal of interest, whether it was PSK31 or JT65 or any of these things. Uh, those things are interesting. What, what would be the ultimate piece of software for that? It would be, I don't care what mode it is. I'm going to go look across the band. I'm going to see a signal, of, a signal that looks somewhat interesting figure out what it is, and then instantiate a software radio modem to use that signal. That work needs to be done and is not really being pursued now. It needs to be done and it's not being pursued. There are the beginnings of it in Joe's software and in 
the, all the PSK31 software, that work, the CW software from uh, Alex Shafkoplius and CW Skimmer, all of those, the pieces are all there, but nobody's put it all together yet with template matching algorithms for that's a PSK31 or that's a CW or that's an FSK or that's a this or that's a that. When that's done, then we'll have a real cognitive radio on HF. The, the other uh, gaping hole that has been observed since August, the, some early date, uh, with the uh, Suitsat 1 uh, slash, era, uh, sorry, Suitsat 2 slash Aerosat 1 uh, has been the ability to use, say, the 5000 as a satellite radio, which was doing all of the Doppler tracking, the decoding of Phil Karn's uh, uh, PSK 1000 software, and the presentation of the data. And seems like everybody out there in the world has been groping for having a solution to that problem of you've got all the power right there you feel that it's in your hands and yet you can't use it yeah yeah so so i we 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 need to thank gerald by the way gerald gave us the um circuitry which uh did the detector and the uh, emitter uh in suitsat uh, to or Arasat. So the, the SDR1000 uh, functional hardware, the mixers, were, uh, uh, and their design and part numbers and everything else was, were donated to the project by Gerald. And the flex, the flex radios were about the best radio to do the entire transponder decoding, just nobody bothered to do it. And we all ran out of time to do, do stuff. And I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.